morning and welcome to Global Digest, your light-hearted look at current affairs around the world. I am Ama Marcus. In today's interconnected world, our data is more valuable than ever. Yet with the rise of digital platforms, the protection of personal information has become a growing concern. Well, recently, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, the FCCP, took a bold step by sanctioning tech giants Meta and WhatsApp over alleged data privacy violations in Nigeria. Well, this action highlights the increasing scrutiny of how these platforms handle our personal data. But what does this mean for consumers, businesses, and the future of digital privacy in Nigeria? On the program today, we delve into the implications of the FCCP's decision, explore the responsibilities of tech companies, and discuss what steps need to be taken to protect Nigerian consumers. Our guest is one of the people who have been working on this since 2021, Mr. Folakumi Pinero. He is a PhD in law candidate at the University of Cambridge. Hello, Mr. Pinero. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm a pleasure to be here as always. Okay. Uh, so, talk, could you talk to us, uh, what is this case FCCP is putting up against WhatsApp and Meta platform? What's it all about? So, just before I, I get started, I want to just clarify that I'm speaking here um, in my personal capacity. Um, of course, I was one of the people that worked on the investigation, but um, I'm speaking here in my own personal capacity. My views that I express here don't represent those of the commission and what i'll be doing here is just to talk you through some of the information that's publicly available so that your listeners can um, get access to that um, firsthand um so what is what is it all about so it was a competition law investigation primarily which had uh, data protection implications as well and so the data protection implications that we were looking at was to do with whether whatsapp accurately or uh, sufficiently complied with the Nigerian data protection regulations with respect to how it obtained consent from Nigerian WhatsApp users in its 2021 privacy policy. And the investigation concluded that the user's consent wasn't obtained in a way that was in compliance with the law. Um, it was obtained through a threat of deletion. So if Nigerian users didn't accept the privacy policy, uh, they faced losing their WhatsApp accounts. And I think they had about um, a month or so to accept the privacy policy. Otherwise, they would lose access to their WhatsApp accounts. And obviously, WhatsApp is a very big player. I mean, we communicated for to organize this interview through WhatsApp. A lot of people use it for work, to connect to their families. Um, it's effectively an essential bit of uh, infrastructure, an essential facility of sorts that people need to use to have access to the internet um, and to connect to their families and, and and all sorts of things like that and you know think about the businesses that are on whatsapp that needed to get access to their customers and so when you're in that sort of position under competition law um, you must not engage with your customers or your suppliers or your consumers in a way that is seen to be an abuse of that economic power that you have and so by mandating that Nigerian WhatsApp users either accept the privacy policy or face losing their accounts, that was seen by the competition authority to constitute an abuse of dominance position. And so that's with the consent, with the manner in which it was obtained. Uh, there were also issues with how the consent was bundled. So in the NDPR, the Nigerian Data Protection Regulations, which was the prevailing uh, regulation at the time of the investigation. Of course, now there's the the NDPA, which is the Nigerian Data Protection Act. Uh, and at the time, the NDPR provided that um, uh, WhatsApp users had to, and any, anyone that's processing data could only give consent for specific data being processed by for specific reasons. And what we saw with the privacy policy was that it bundled data processing for many different reasons in some cases the data was being processed to use whatsapp in some cases it was being shared with facebook in some cases it was being um you know sent across the you know to a different country and that 
bundling of the data is in opposition to what was in the spirit and the letter of the NDPR. Uh, so th those were some of the issues we had with consent, and really the underlying logic for all of this was that WhatsApp was only able to do this because it's in a position of dominance, because it has the ability in computational language to behave independently from its customers, its consumers, and its suppliers. Mm. Um, there were also issues to do with how much data was actually being collected. So what the commission did was to compare the data points, and this was some work that was done with the with NITA at the time. So the commission uh, looked at how much data is being collected by uh, Telegram, by Signal, to see how much is actually needed to operate a, an instant messaging platform. And we found, the commission found that the data being collected was actually excessive. And so you have these, a range of these different kinds of abuses. And that was sort of what the investigation was hinged on, that there was an abuse of dominance position that, that was predicated on this um, failure to comply with the privacy regulations in Nigeria. Mm. So how does this breach affect the average Nigerian user? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. So Nigerians are one of the biggest markets for WhatsApp in Africa. Um, I think there's about, um, you know, 30 to 40 million users um, in the country. So that's quite a lot of people. Um, people use WhatsApp for a variety of different reasons, for businesses, um, to communicate with their colleagues, to communicate with their families, um, to meet people all across the world. And I think one of the things that is important here is that because WhatsApp is so important, and this is sort of what, I, what I was alluding to in my first response, is that it has an obligation to comply with the law. It has an obligation to protect users and treat them fairly. And if you're engaging in a practice whereby you are um, mandating that people either have to accept your terms or leave the app, that is an abuse of your dominance position. And what you then see happen is that um, the rights and, and, and you know, liberties that are enshrined to Nigerians, not just in the NDPR, because obviously that was what I referred to, but also in the constitution, right? That we have our right to privacy that's protected in the constitution. And if you if you have a private player that is engaging in these sort of practices that is um, opposed to how um, Nigeria should be protected, you have a clear abuse there. And that, that's something that the Nigerian legal framework seeks to um, protect. Um, but then also, you know, we think about, you mentioned in your introduction that the online world is becoming much more far reaching. It's affecting many more areas of our lives. And WhatsApp, Meta, Facebook being such a big uh, player in this space, a big you know, interconnected, interconnected group of companies have an outsized effect on how this online world operates. And so it's important to make sure that even the biggest players have to comply with the privacy regulations that are meant to protect all Nigerians at all times while they engage in the digital economy. Mm. So, how does the FCCP's decision align with global trends in data privacy regulations? Yeah, so one of the things that I, I, I found most interesting was that this isn't just the FCCPC almost acting like a lone wolf. You know, there are many other countries across the world. Um, India, for example, Germany had a similar, very similar investigation as well. Um, Brazil, the United States, Texas in, in the United States. Um, and most, most notably, perhaps, is the European Union. So the EU has actually um, recently passed a Digital Markets Act that seeks to regulate the digital economy. Um, and Facebook and uh, Meta, WhatsApp are all implicated in this act. They've been designated as gatekeepers, mm. um, which means that they are players that operate a um, core platform service and um, you know, as a result of that, they are a significant gateway for users to have access to um, the internet. And so one of the things we've seen in the Digital Markets Act is that these um, gatekeepers are not allowed to um, combine data from customers from different sources without their consent. And this is one of the things that we saw um, uh, fa uh, Facebook, Meta, WhatsApp doing um, because the points I mentioned earlier about the bundling of consent, so 
you know, you have the consent to use WhatsApp and have your data processed in the context of WhatsApp. You also have um, consent for um, Facebook uh, and Instagram to have the data from your WhatsApp combined there as well. Um, so you have all these, these these ways in which your data is being bundled and and you know used to build an elaborate profile about you. And the EU Digital Market Act has come out very directly to say that that sort of behaviour is not acceptable by these gatekeepers. And so we're seeing that sort of be a trend. It's not something that is unique to Nigeria. It just so happens that these are the same companies that will inevitably engage in the same kinds of and competitive practices wherever they operate in the world. Um, I mean, we see it in the context of the, in competition at least, we see it in the context of the payments um, uh, players. So players like MasterCard and Visa, and we also see it with um, uh, the, the, you know, companies like Coca-Cola as well. The, the trend is that these are, you know, global companies. They tend to have very similar business models wherever they operate. And as a result, once one competition authority goes after them, you tend to see that other competition authorities tend to pick up as well and also go after them for the same abuses because chances are they're doing the same things across the world. Um, BAT, how could I forget, as well as another example where the Nigerian Competition Authority um, recently fined them $110 um, million. Again, other competition authorities have done similar investigations into BAT, found roughly the same sort of practices. So it's not a surprise to see this kind of thing happen. And I think it's a sign of things to come for the... Um, there is an economy more generally. Mm. So let's look at data privacy right now. What are the potential mm -hmm. risks for Nigerian consumers? For example, in this case, for those who use, you know, the apps on Meta platform and WhatsApp, what risk do they stand to, you know, have if their data is not adequately protected by tech companies? Yeah, so for starters, one of the problems is that you can have your data sort of gleaned and used to target ads at you and that, that's that's really the core of the concern here so if your data is being taken and it's used to target ads at you um what's stopping the advertisers from targeting you with adverts uh, you know when you're uh, you're one of your most vulnerable periods maybe you're you know having mental health issues and they target ads to you because they know that you're more likely to purchase a particular product um you know there's instances of that happening um, there, there's also instances, and this is, you know, perhaps more on a, a national scale, where whereby you have um, a company that is able to sell your data to a third party that can then target political ads at you to influence you to vote in a certain way, um, or to influence you to not vote at all. And there was a lot of evidence that this is what happened using Facebook data in the 2016 Trump election and also the 2016 Brexit referendum as well, whereby certain demographics, in Trump's case, you know, certain demographics of um, black men were given adverts um, through their Facebook accounts to not come out to vote. And then we saw in those particular districts, almost like clockwork, that the number of black men coming out to vote was lower than previous elections. And as a result, Trump was able to win those um, districts. And so you're seeing it be used as a way to to suppress votes. Um, the, the scandal I just spoke about with Brexit and Trump is actually referred to as the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And what's quite interesting is that they actually did a test run for this model, this business model, in Nigeria and in Kenya um, in the elections we had just before that. So in uh, Good Luck Jonathan's election, um, they, you know, th this was something that was tried and done as like a pilot study to see whether they could export this model to the to other um, democracies and, and countries across the world. So I think it poses threats that you know, if we don't have our privacy protected online, it poses threats to our um, mental well-being, to our, our, our financial autonomy, but it also poses serious threats to our political institutions as well and the, the, the credibility um, of our democracy as a whole. Mm. So when we log into apps now i'm taking this from you know normal experiences you have you know terms and conditions that you're expected to accept to you know before you get to use the app and most times these you know terms and conditions they change as you get to use the app as it goes on so how do consumers ensure their personal data is secure when using social media platforms and also messaging platforms as well 
because some of these you know information most nigerians might not have the opportunity nor the time to go through them when they're setting up you know their application so how do consumers take moves or what moves can consumers take to ensure that their personal data is secure when using these platforms yeah i mean it, it's very tricky because i've been doing a lot of research in this field privacy law and data protection and how it affects competition law in fact my master's thesis actually focused on this issue this was about five years ago now okay. uh, where i looked at how uh, online pl platforms compete to protect our privacy and what's interesting is that i am perhaps none the wiser on how best to protect your privacy online because it's such a difficult environment to navigate um, you mentioned with privacy policies you know that they're made deliberately you know, long and lengthy and difficult to understand opaque uh, and so as a result you don't really know how well to navigate this sort of space as a consumer um and i saw just before which we came online i just did a quick uh, search to find out how long it would take you to read privacy policies if let's say you're someone who uses the internet on you know not particularly longer than like most people, you know, you, you're an average user. It would take you 244 hours every year to read uh, privacy policies that you come across, which is a shocking amount of time that most people don't have. Um, and so um, some, of the I, some of the things I do, not to make this very gloomy, I, some of the things I do is that I, I use um, VPNs, so virtual uh, private networks that, you know, pr protect your browsing, you know, they can conceal your IP address. Um, I also use ad blockers as well, so preventing your uh, advertisers from getting to you as you're surfing the internet. Um, you could also use in some phones, there's a feature where you can ask certain apps not to track you. Mm. Um, so this is another thing, right? When you download an application, uh, they sometimes they can track you when you're not using the application. Yeah, they can track apps. what you're doing. Yeah, across apps. Exactly. exactly, they can track you across apps, and so that can be you know obviously also the breach of your privacy mm. um, interestingly when whatsapp was acquired by by facebook facebook had used a, a vpn that they uh, cryptically installed into people's phones called onavo and onavo was uh, feeding data back to facebook to allow them to see what apps people were using when they weren't using facebook mm. and it was through that data that they were able to identify whatsapp as something that was a, a competitive threat and that was what informed their decision to actually acquire WhatsApp. Um, and then there's, there's you know, leaked presentations of slides showing data from Onavo that everyone can, can Google and check out. Um, so what I do, I, I also ask certain apps not to track me. Um, but then I also try and use other sources as well. So for searching, occasionally I'll use DuckDuckGo. So DuckDuckGo. Uh, they're an alternative search engine. Um, they don't track you based on your previous searches. Mm. They just show you the search results okay. um, as you as you want them. And so those kind of alternatives are, are there. Yeah. They're not as good, admittedly, as the more established players. But I think that they provide a decent alternative for the mm. time being. Okay, so I know your you know the what you're giving out in this program right now if these are personal uh you know your personal research and of course what you have to say personally now i know these are independence of the fccp's you know investigations and what they're doing but how would you think uh the fccp's investigations and of course their you know sanctions would be effective in, in enforcing regulations and of course what challenges would they face along the way in making sure that these tech giants you know they come to terms with our laws and regulations as it comes to protection of data yeah i think the fccpc has been quite effective um of course i'm biased because i have worked with them but i think looking at the the continent and the african continent to see um how active other regulators have been not just in the digital economy but uh, across different sectors as well and yeah. um, the fccpc is definitely one of the more active regulators one of the more active enforcers um, and we see it setting that tone for enforcement across the, the continent. I mean, the digital economy generally isn't one that is easy to regulate, um, which is why the EU passed the Digital Markets Act to take it away effectively from competition enforcement and put it in the context of a sector regulator that mandates that these are the things you have to follow in, if you're going to operate in the EU, okay. right? So they effectively gave up on this approach of you observe the markets you see abuses happen 
and then you do an investigation which might take three four five six seven eight years and then you intervene after that they effectively given up on that model in the eu and they just decided you know what let's just um uh, regulate these players and set the rules and conditions under which they're going to deliver their services in the eu mm. um, so it's difficult uh, i don't know whether the FCCPC is able to do that at the moment, but I think there's promise further down the line for it to really set a, a precedent in the African context and also to bring together other African agencies to work on this um, sector and other sectors as well that affect the uh, African consumers. Okay. Um, but then it's also the, the problems that it faces. I think really there's a problem of, there's two problems I see. So one is of leverage. So the EU is a massive common market. Um, it has many, many uh, users within it. The, the GDP cap per capita is much higher than um, many other places in the world. And so what you have is that if the EU passes a, a an extreme policy measure, most companies will still have to comply with it. They're not going to say, we're going to leave the EU. It's unrealistic. Uh, and we see this with um, with Apple. They recently had to change their chargers for their iPhones because yeah. the EU made this as an official policy, right? And now all iPhones across the world, the new iPhones, at least the iPhone 15s onwards, now have USB-C charging ports instead of the Apple-made lightning cables. So you see the EU they have this leverage and this ability to implement its policies across many different kinds of companies. Um, but then in Nigeria and in other countries that are negotiating with these companies one-on-one, -on -one, you see a lot less leverage. Um, so, and this isn't just a Nigerian problem. Like, you know, Australia had a same, similar issue with Facebook where they were passing an, an act to um, have Facebook operate in a more fair manner with um, media outlets in Australia. And Facebook pulled, pulled out of Australia completely, right? So... Um, these are things that can happen because it's one country negotiating against this big player. Mm. Um, and of course, we've seen threats that WhatsApp could be removed from Nigeria as well. Uh, we don't know whether that's likely, but you know, it's it just shows that there's an issue with leverage. They wouldn't be able to play that same game in the EU. Um, and then the another problem I see is that um, in government relations with the public in Nigeria, there's a massive trust deficit. Um, I once the, the fine came out, I unfortunately spent a lot of time looking at the responses of people on social media, and it was quite interesting to see that there was a lot of people that just thought this was, a, you know, a terrible move, and um, you know, thought that this was the government just trying to grab out some more money and um, trying to, you know, embarrass Nigeria on a global scale. But this is something that we have been working on for many, many years. It wasn't just a, a money grab; all the the fines and the penalties were costed in accordance with the administrative penalties regulations. And so I think seeing that level of distrust, and I don't by no means blame the people for distrusting the government. I think there's more that the government can do to regain the trust of people. Um, but I think that also makes regulatory work a bit more difficult in the, in the Nigerian context. Uh, and I think it's for the government, not just the FCCPC, but the government more generally to do more to regain the trust of the people. Okay. So, real quick before I let you go, this is the first of okay. its kind. And it's not something Nigerians are used to or have seen. You've mentioned a couple of other countries that have had to do this kind of battle with tech company. Now, this is the first. How do you think these developments would influence global tech companies in approaching data privacy in other emerging markets? Yeah, I think that they're more likely to engage with emerging markets on a more case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um, so instead of trying to mandate one business model across the world, I think this will sort of prompt uh, these companies to think more about how each country differs in its legal, regulatory, political landscape and try to fine-tune their service offering and service delivery to those particular countries. Uh, I think this idea that you can just have one business model and not care about the uniqueness of the um, regulatory landscape of each country is, uh, you know, something that's not going to hold much water in the long term. Um, and then also, I think in terms of the legal advisors that they try to get as well, not just getting um, 
legal advisors that are willing to tell them, you know, this is, you know, possible and, you know, we can do everything for you if you want. And, you know, we, we can always make sure your, your business model fits in with, it is able to be implemented regardless of what our legal framework says. I think getting legal advisors that can actually be honest with these players and to tell them, you know, this is how you have to comply. You might have to change this aspect of your business model. You, you might have to um, stop engaging in these kind of practices. I think that will be something that we'll see hopefully change in the future as well. Okay, hopefully. Mr. Pinero, it's been a pleasure having you on the show as usual. We appreciate you taking out time to speak with us. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. So we've been speaking on data privacy in the digital age. Now, this is off the backdrop of the FCCP sanctions on Meta and WhatsApp. We've been speaking with Mr. Pinero. He is a PhD in law candidate at the University of Cambridge. We're watching Global Digest on 8BN. We bring more reports from the rest of the world after this break.